Welcome everybody to our Invasive Species Citizen Science Training. My name is Ann Pierce and I coordinate the Wisconsin First Detector Network and we are a statewide citizen science program for monitoring invasive species and I work out of UW-Madison Extension. And then I'll let my co-host Matt introduce himself. Hi all, this is Matt Walrath and I work with the Upper Sugar River Watershed Association out of Mount Horeb and I serve as the Invasive Species Project Coordinator for, we call it Upper Sugar because it's a bit of a long name. So at Upper Sugar, I do citizen training, a lot of invasive species monitoring, and we do citizen-based projects on the ground. And we're doing some of this stuff remotely, but we look forward to getting to get outside with everyone. And uh, visit our website, uppersugar.org. We've got some different events happening around the area remotely for you to check out. And once that goes to a different uh, situation, we'll get to see you soon outside. And we're always looking for more volunteers to help us do scouting and monitoring and work days. So we'd love to have you join in on uh, making the Dane County area a little, a little brighter. I'm gonna start by trying to put invasive species monitoring into a context that can hopefully help you understand why we're really interested in uh, training people to map and report invasive species. And for us, I think of it in terms of management, because our ultimate goal is to manage these species so that we can protect our watersheds and our ecosystems and our native plants and animals that are impacted by invasive species. And so when we think about managing invasive species, one framework to look at it is to break it up into the five steps that you see on your screen. The first step is identifying the species that you have, and that's both the invasive species that you want to manage, but also species around that you'd like to protect. The second step is understanding the population of those species, and in particular of the invasive species. Third step is researching and selecting appropriate and effective management techniques for the invasive species. And this is a really key step because invasive species management is very species specific. So once you've selected those techniques, the fourth step is to apply the management techniques. And then of course, we need to look at follow-up monitoring and treatment because you can't just manage an infestation and then assume everything's fine. You definitely need to go back and look at it. So today we're really focusing on steps one and two of this. So Matt, in a few short minutes, will be talking about some of the priority species and how you can identify them. Uh, and then step two, this understanding the species population, what we're really looking at for that is mapping where these species are and how much of them there are. Because with limited time and financial resources that we can put towards invasive species management, we really need to have as much information as we can get about what species we have, how big the infestations are, and where they are, so that we can prioritize what species we're managing, where we're managing them, and how we can manage them. And so hopefully that helps to kind of set the context for what we're doing. One of the reasons that we really love working with volunteers, which I know many of you on our webinar today are volunteers in various capacities, is that once we have more people who can recognize these invasive species, uh, your super valuable sets of eyes out on the ground that can help us detect new infestations of species, which is the easiest time to manage them and also help share a lot of information that we can get to organizations like Upper Sugar River Watershed Association or to public land managers to plan their invasive species management. So right now we're going to transition and uh, switch over to Matt's screen and he's going to bring us through some of the top species that we're worried about in uh, the Dane County, South Central, Southwestern Wisconsin area. Hello everybody. Um, without further ado, let's talk a bit about invasive species that we are of concern within our region. So first, I wanna talk about the categories that we're gonna see, and this comes from our state law about how we prioritize the control of invasive species. And you're gonna see these orange R's and red P's inside a Wisconsin outline as we go through my portion of this presentation. And that's gonna tell you 
the status of how they're treated by the Wisconsin DNR for priority. So that R for restricted and that orange color there means that they're listed legally for consideration as an invasive species. However, they're pretty widespread and the odds of us ever getting rid of them entirely is pretty low. And so we like to know they're out there and we really rely on our citizens for reports. However, they don't get quite the same uh, funding because and, and priority because I don't think we're ever going to really quite get rid of them entirely. That is contrasted with the prohibited species and what changed here is that you're not allowed to possess these. For restricted species you can have them in your yard, it's not considered a big deal. For these prohibited ones it's illegal to possess them and uh, therefore they get higher priority because they're often just moving into the state and with focus effort and early detection it's going to be much more valuable as we stop their spread so that's what you're going to see when you see that upper right hand corner for prohibited versus restricted so without further ado we're going to get into the species that have been uh, commonly found in the area first and then we're going to go from dry to wet too so they are working through different kinds of things. Now all these species are in ed maps, which we'll get to later as far as reporting, which means that you can follow up and if you know of a population, get that into the database based upon what information you're gonna get from Anne here in a moment. Uh, so without further ado, everyone's favorite in the springtime, garlic mustard. You can see an occurrence map down here on the bottom left that people like you help us to get live. It is a biennial, which means that it lives for uh, two years. And right now it's gonna be in this sort of small stage. You see um, these little uh, fringed leaves coming out. Once it flowers, it's gonna have white flowers, four petals each. And it's very distinctive because you can go ahead and crush this and it does smell like garlic. There's even recipes for it. So like we like to say sometimes in the nascent species world, if you can't beat it, eat it. So this is a great one to pick as long as you are, make sure you know the land use history of where you're collecting stuff, but it can be hand pulled and is a, uh, a tasty addition. You can make pesto with it. Now garlic mustard, it is restricted. Up next, we've got the buckthorns. So two of them are listed as restricted in the state. And here's kind of our, our layout of where they occur, and this is likely underreported. If, if you know buckthorns, you know that they're everywhere in the state. So they're going to start uh, flowering in May, and here's some pictures of them for you to, uh, to look at. So you can see these, these uh, what, they call, what they call glossy is definitely more glossy and versus the common, but the common is also somewhat glossy. So you can't quite, it's not quite definitive. And a little bit about their, they've got these, uh, these bumps on their bark. Understory, little shrubby tree grows to be about 15 feet tall on average, though it can get pretty big and very common in our part of South Central and Southwest Wisconsin. Moving along, we've got one of our, one of our nastiest ones, which is to say wild parsnip. So it's got this characteristic carrot flower top that you might uh, associate with Queen Anne's lace, though that would be white. These are called umbels, and it's a perennial, so it'll it'll come back. And it has uh, it has these distinctive kind of double sets. So there's another one that comes off the bottom. Main thing up here, bright bright yellow. More pictures of it. This is what it looks like. This upper right hand corner when it's in its uh, what we call a rosette stage, basal rosette. Kind of weedy margins. And it's got this sort of uneven plane to it with those ruffled edges and pretty distinctive looking. The stems themselves are grooved and kind of not, you know, they've got this, this sort of streaked look to them that will grow out of the center of a rosette. And it does spread pretty quickly along our roadsides and fence lines. It likes full sun. So when you see a wall of yellow like that, make caution your first priority because this stuff does have a sap 
that if it gets on your skin and that sap is then exposed to sunlight, it can cause what look like second degree burns. So avoid this stuff, report it when you see it. We want to know where it is. There are some lookalikes out there. Uh, so this is cow parsnip on the left. And it's got that kind of white, again, Queen Anne's lace carrot flower. And Golden and Alexander, which is probably the closest lookalike to it that actually does have that yellow top, but the, the leaf shape uh, is different. The leaf margins are different. Moving along to bush honeysuckle. This is a picture of it in bloom. Another shrubby tree up to 12 feet tall, sometimes a little bit taller, but lots and lots of branches on them. They are opposite, and if you're not familiar with, with opposite and alternate, it's a really good basic key to telling species apart. These are opposite, and they are kind of, uh, they have a distinctive peeling bark to them. A good way to tell them apart from other, other stuff out there. Uh, it's just, they have that peeling bark. And we have a few different varieties. These are all restricted here with the current maps down below. So easiest to tell in when they're flowering. That's kind of the, the, the best way to get a positive idea on these guys. Notice the kind of soft marginal leaf shape and that shrubby size. They're starting to leaf out right about now. So those are really common terrestrial invasives that you're gonna see at your parks. We're gonna move on to our more wetland or stream bank invasive species to cover. And the first one here is our Japanese knotweed. It's a member of the knotweed family, and there's a bunch of different similar species, but they all have a basic characteristic for how they grow. They are, in fact, bamboo-like, meaning that the stems, as you see them, are hollow and have nodes on them. And it looks like you would buy them to use for bamboo, but they're quite soft. Uh, they, they don't have the same rigid structure as bamboo wood itself, so you can snap them right in half with your hand. It can be quite, quite tall, more than 10 feet, I've seen up to 16 feet. They do have these spade-like leaves, and they're quite easy to recognize when they, when they flower, but you can actually recognize them right now as well. So this next slide has a few pictures. So here's that bamboo-like stem here, and you can kind of see it there. This is what they look like in the, when they start to go to sleep in the fall and they have this distinctive dead bamboo look so if you if you see something like that you might know that you have a uh, an infestation you can come back and check in the spring they're starting to shoot up little asparagus looking reddish green pink shoots right about now it's really bad it can take over huge sides of uh of river banks and these big stands that outcompete everything else and it's definitely a threat to property values, the one you want to know. Up next, another restricted species, purple loosestrife, a lovely plant uh, that was used to be used in the trade. So it has uh, this beautiful purple stalk on it, and they flower from the bottom to the top. It's all over the state. It is a perennial, so it's going to keep on coming back year after year. It can be pretty tall, and it does like moist the sites. has a distinctive flower on it and as I said so you can see they start at the bottom and they kind of work their way up like that and they do have a a kind of knobby four to five sided appearance so in this picture you can kind of see the ridges so even right now when they're asleep you find out a woody thing in a wetland that has that distinctive four to five sides it's a good chance it might be this type of plant there is a biocontrol program out there for this the releasing of these beetles so a great reason to get that on the map. If you, we know where there's big populations of this that we can verify, it adds extra incentive to get a biocontrol project going for the long-term control of it. And I'm happy, if you're interested in learning more about that, drop me an email and I'm happy to follow up and talk more about that. Moving on, we're getting a little more serious. So these have all been restricted. Now we're getting to our first split listed species. And one of my personal nemesis is Phragmites. It's called common reed, but in the biology community, we call it Phragmites. And this is an example of a prioritization tool used by the DNR up here in the upper right-hand corner. You'll notice it's both red and orange, prohibited and restricted. That's a prioritization that we can then use to get funds where it does not exist. And you can see why that might be the case. If you look at this map over here on the right, there is a ton along the Michigan shoreline in that basin. Once you get out to 
Madison and tries to tail off, kind of following I-90. And then out here in the Driftless, where I work a lot, it hasn't really got the same amount of penetration. So we want to really get those reports of stuff, especially in the counties that are um, west of Dane. It grows up to be 20 feet tall, and it clones itself. It's a perennial. It keeps on coming back year after year. It can be hard to tell from its native, but I'll, I'll give you a few. A few uh, if you see this massive, what people call a bottle brush plant, it grows by these underground runners. The native version is much less dense on average, has smooth stems, tends to drop its leaves. And I think this is an important slide. So we want you to know this, but we also want you to, to be aware that there is a native version of this. You can see the vigor on the seed head is a lot different. So not native has all these branches. Native is much thinner. The vigor of the native frag just isn't quite as tall, isn't quite the same as the little guys hidden in there. They do crossbreed too. So if you're not sure, you can always snap a picture and send it to a biologist or best is to uh, yeah, record where it is and then we can follow up on it at a later time. Coming up next is another split listed plant, the Japanese hops. It's in the hops family. So it, it, while unfortunately you cannot make beer with it, but it does have that characteristic hop leaf to it and hop floral structures here. They have up to five lobes. You'll see some of them with more and it has these notable prickly little, these, these little hairs you can kind of see along the stem, those little, they're quite irritating to your hands. So if you try to pull this stuff by hand, it's pretty unpleasant. And even goats don't prefer it. There's a goat project out in Vernon County where they're taking care of the stuff, but it hasn't, uh, they'll eat around it, which makes it easier to treat, but they don't actually like it that much themselves. You see a climbing vine? Let us know that looks like this, uh, this hop. Now we're getting into some more of what we would consider the rare early detection species. So this is porcelain berry, or they call it uh, pepper berry, I believe, as well. And it has these really beautiful multicolored, Easter looking colored uh, pastel berries on it. So it has been traditionally used in floral arrangements, and you'll see it used there. It's starting to spread. There's a, there's a patch of it in the Madison area. It's not very widely spread here quite yet. Can grow very very fast, cover big sides of of a hillside or other trees. Hairy stems, these kind of cool looking, deeply cut in, uh, shiny leaves here. And don't confuse it with wild grape. We do have a wild grape that is that is native. And the one of the biggest ways to tell that is the how the tendrils come out, which is how it climbs things. Are they branched? The a shredding bark like like a grape arborvitum you would think of is right there. And if you cut it open, the pith is the inside. So white pith versus a brown pith for those characteristics. So that's porcelain berry. In our vine category, now you're gonna notice this is golden creeper. This is on our early detection list. You'll notice there is no thing up there in the upper right hand corner that's gonna tell you is it prohibited or restricted. It is neither at the moment, but it definitely could be th posing a threat to our, our native environment. You can see how aggressive it is, and it's been taking over the sides of, uh, of rivers, river banks, and climbing up into people's yards. So quite aggressive. Um, it is in the cucumber family, so not to be confused with our, with our native, native wild cucumbers. Um, has this heart-shaped, leaf here with these these kind of beautiful yellow flowers so we'd like to know where it is because so we can then we can know where we to direct our efforts and some tests have already begun to do that to get it uh, reported and uh, try treatments on it so here's the latest and greatest verified reports as it spreads uh, in the area so thanks to our thanks to the archive master for getting a report to me this is this is a fresh poll so this is what we know it is so it's it's spreading around the state and we wanna make sure we report it. Moving on to our fully aquatic species. We're gonna go back to the restricted land. This one's been around for a while and we are in the, this is Eurasian water milfoil. So it's in a lot of lakes around the region and the most distinctive way that you can tell Eurasian water milfoil from other milfoils is that it has a lot of these pairs of leaflets. So one pair of leaflet it, each one of these counts as one. So you get it under, you get it in your hand, you count all these up. And if you have 12, 
more than 10, really, the odds are pretty good that it's going to be the original water mill foil. It's important. So it, it clogs up the bottoms of lakes. I've got a nice little ID pictures here from uh, Paul Squinsky. And it does spread by fragments along boat trailers and propellers. I'll talk a bit more about decontamination here at the end of this because that's a big part of my job is educating people about that. Moving on, another common aquatic species, curly leaf pondweed, Portmagidon crispus. I, just, I love that name for some reason. It has a distinctive lasagna noodle look to its leaves. See how they're wavy? They have these little teeth on the margins. We have a lot of other, what we would call pond weeds. They're not weeds, they're, some of them are native and we consider them to be a good part of a lake. However, this one does spread pretty quickly. And so if you see this kind of wavy margin with a little, with this wavy looking edge with these little teeth, that's gonna be your curly leaf pond weed. And uh, it makes these cool little turians that they, at the end that can then overwinter too. So clean off your boat, clean off your gear when you're moving stuff around. And finally, this is going to be our only, our only non-plant on here, the New, the New Zealand mud snail. And the New Zealand mud snail is really quite small. So when you see this large and in charge on your computer, this guy looks big, right? Well, they're only between three to six millimeters. So this bottom left picture has, these are millimeter marks. So count this guy off, one, two, three, four. This is about four and a half millimeters. They're really, really small. And they can have a, a degree of color from this kind of golden tan all the way to black or brown. And the key is a sense of scale. They can really grow very, very fast in a region and clog up these rocks. Now, a really important thing about them is that they are called dextral, right hand coiling. So if you were to hold this little snail up in front of you, facing it directly, the trap door is on the right side. And that's an important characteristic. They are spread often by trout fishermen and by people using boats because the small little, the villagers, the juveniles are microscopically small. So make sure to wash your stuff off. And I'm gonna just, because this is really present in our region, and we're unique that we in Wisconsin that, that we have the only known populations of New Zealand mud snails. So clicking along here, here is where these snails that we, we know that they've been before, each one of these purple check marks has a, uh, a verified population. And they're mostly clustered right in the watershed that I am charged to protect uh, here from Verona down to Belleville and all of these regions up to Mesomani here, this black earth is where it was first discovered. Here is the list of all the spots from the DNR that they, they have confirmed. This is a nice sense of scale too. You can see just how small these things are in somebody's hands. So if you're in one of these creeks, make extra special care to decontaminate your gear after use. And because I said it's part of my job, I know it's not ID, but if you're out there doing this stuff, it's very important that we are not causing further harm when we're trying to help the environment. So what can you do to prevent New Zealand mud snails in particular? Get some new boots, retire those old felt sole boots. They love to move around on that stuff. Uh, whenever you're doing work like this, if you can work upstream to downstream, even when fishing or recreating, that also helps prevent the spread. Before you leave the water, inspect it and remove anything you can find. Make sure you drain all of the water out of your gear, including duct lines or you know decoys, whatever else it is. Scrub and rinse. So bring some water with you, give them a spray bottle as you leave. We also are doing a project to build these boot brush stations. So if you see one of these on the landscape, give it a kick. Give it a brush, make yourself clean going in and going out. And then finally, for this one in particular, if you think you've been exposed or in a region that has a lot of these, these are the recommended steps. So freezing it for a while, if you have a chest freezer, soaking it in hot water that you can do in a, uh, right in your, your washing machine is also a pretty good solution or using a steam cleaner. So just a reminder that that's, these are kind of the things. Play, clean, go. We're the Stop Aquatic Kitsch Hackers. You'll see this kind of stuff out there. So when you're doing this work and helping us out with the ID, make sure you're not also making the problem worse by cleaning your gear. 
clean gears, happy gear, and the environment will appreciate it. Because we just talked about identification, and thanks, Matt, for your great tips on identifying those species, um, I wanted to share some of the resources we have on our First Detector Network website related to identification. And we work mostly with terrestrial invasive plants, and so there's other great resources for additional identification information for some of those aquatic species that Matt mentioned. But I'm showing you on the screen right now our First Detector Network website. The URL is highlighted at the top, but if you're interested in accessing our uh, identification videos on the right side of the home page, you can click on I want to access fact sheets and ID videos. And so you'll see a page like this. And this is our list of videos that we've created so far. And then they're just two to three minute videos that show these plants uh, growing out in the world and pointing out the key characteristics you can use to identify these plants and how you can tell them apart from native lookalike species. So that's a, a nice resource for you. But one of the things we want to emphasize is how you can help us figure out where these are by reporting them. And so with the First Detector Network, we primarily work with reporting tools from the EDMAP system. And so I'm going to bring us over to the EDMAPS website, which is just eddmaps.org. And I know we talked about an app today, and we'll get to that in a minute, but this EDMAPS website is kind of the base of the app and the reporting tools that we use. And so on this website, uh, you can look up information about invasive species. And this is a national website, so it has hundreds and hundreds of species on it, but you can look in the search box and maybe you wanted to double check how you can identify Japanese knotweed, one of those species that Matt mentioned. Um, as I start typing that in, this list will update eventually uh, and you can click on the species name to learn more about it. The other thing you can do on EdMaps is report sightings. And so now we're really gonna dig into how you can help us track where these species are. And so before you actually report a sighting, if you haven't registered for an account yet, it's going to ask you to sign in. And so if you're new to EdMaps or new to the Great Lakes Early Detection Network app that we'll talk about in a few minutes, the first thing that you can do is click on the little human in the upper right hand corner of the EdMaps website. Um, I'm logged in right now, so it's giving me the option to log out. But if you aren't logged in or you don't have an account, you'll see an option to register for an account here. And registering just means that you put down your name and your email. You can add what organization you're with if that seems applicable. So if you're a regular volunteer for Upper Sugar River Watershed Association, you can put that on your registration form. But all the other information on that registration form is totally optional. Once you're registered, that means that you can report these sightings and the report verifiers can communicate with you via the email that you used. And so if I wanted to report a plant, it's going to ask me when I first report where, we're in Wisconsin, so we'll let that load. And you'll note at the top of the page here, it says that red fields are required. And so those are the requirements that EdMap sets for each of its records, but it's the same requirements that we adhere to with the First Detector Network. So we're gonna ask you to tell us what species you have or what species you think it is, because it's okay if you're not totally sure on the identification, but if you think you found Japanese hops, go ahead and put that as a species name. Uh, we'll stick with garlic mustard right now because that's out and about everywhere. The next thing is the observation date, so when did you see it? This will automatically fill in with the date that you filled out the form, but say you saw it three weeks ago, uh, you can go ahead and adjust the date there. You'll see there's a lot of other information that you can add, but the next piece of information that we require you to share is where you found it. So you can type in the county, and then this map on the right will zoom into the, the county that you typed in. Now, if you maybe had a GPS unit or, or took a picture that was tagged with the latitude and longitude, and you have that information, you can just type that into the box. Otherwise, you can zoom in on the map Let's see, I know that there's garlic mustard at the Lakeshore Preserve, so we'll, we'll zoom in there and make a report. And so on the top of the map box, you can add a marker to mark a point on the map. So if you were to see one plant, that would be a good option. 
Now, of course, I don't know of anybody who has ever seen just one single garlic mustard plant. So usually a better option for garlic mustard is this draw a shape or polygon feature. So I'm gonna zoom back out on my map and you just click where you want the edges of that polygon to be. So you can show that there's a big infestation. It's not just one single plant. And when you're reporting, um, it's really nice to use this polygon option because then the people that get your reports who might be making management decisions know that they're dealing with a larger infestation versus just a single plant because that's going to really impact what kind of resources they might throw at the problem. If I scroll back up, you'll see that this infested area box has automatically calculated based on that polygon that I drew. So that's even more valuable information for those land managers. Now they know they have about four tenths of an acre of garlic mustard to deal with based on my polygon versus, again, that single plant. So EdMaps does not require you to upload images, but we strongly encourage you to upload pictures of the species that you're reporting. And that's for a couple of reasons, one of which is that we verify all of the reports that come into the EdMap system. And so right now, even if you've never used EdMaps before, you could go to the website and click on this distribution maps tab at the top of the page and select a species and see where people have reported a species across the United States. In Wisconsin, though, we don't release any of those reports until they have been verified. So if you click on distribution maps and you're looking at reports in Wisconsin, it means that some human in the state of Wisconsin who knows something about the species that you reported has taken a look at your report and made sure that the identification was accurate before releasing it to the database. And so we really rely on pictures to help us out with that. Now I know Matt and I know that he knows how to identify garlic mustard. So if he were to send me a garlic mustard report without a picture and it's in Madison, I'm probably not going to question it. But basically until the verifiers kind of understand your level of identification knowledge, uh, we ask that you submit pictures and then we definitely require pictures for any of those species that are prohibited or early detection species. So things like the knotweeds, phragmites, uh, if you think you found golden creeper or porcelain berry, we definitely want pictures on those. So you can upload the pictures uh, and then the bottom you just submit your report. And what happens when you submit a report is that um, verifiers who work on reports from the county that you reported from will get a notification that a report has been submitted and then the verifier will review your report. And if it looks good, then they release that record and let it go to the public side of the database. If they have questions about it, they'll send you an email with the email that you signed up for the EdMaps account with. And so that's the EdMaps website. One other thing I want to point out here is whether you use the website to submit reports or whether you use the app that we're about to share. One way that you can manage your reports is with this My EdMaps tab, which is at the upper right corner of your screen. And so when you click on that, um, this is basically on the left side now, we'll show you your personal menu. And so the third option down is reports. If I click on that, now I will see all of the reports that I have ever submitted to EdMaps, whether that's on the website itself or through one of the apps. So you can see I've been finding a lot of squill lately uh, in, in the Dane County area. We're helping out our friends at Minnesota Extension on a squill reporting project. But if I scroll over to the right side of the page. On the right side, you can view your reports, edit them, revisit them, or delete them. So if a verifier asks you to upload a picture because you didn't have one at first, you could do that by clicking on edit, and that will get you back to that same form that you just filled out. Uh, you can add whatever you need to and then submit it, and that just updates your report. I just showed you the EdMaps website, and that's all fine and dandy, uh, but if you're really serious about doing a lot of mapping or you see a lot of invasives out where you might normally paddle or walk or do whatever you do outside, uh, it's much easier to be able to report and map these species using the app.
And so the Great Lakes Early Detection Network app is the app that EdMaps has designed for the Upper Great Lakes region. And basically that just means that the species that are included in this app are those that you'll find here in Wisconsin and in our neighboring states. They have additional apps for other regions of the country that adjust the species list to fit the species that are in those other regions. And so I wanna share a few features of the app and show you how you can report using the app, which is a much easier way than I think than using the website. So if you see the menu on the left side of the screen, the top three options, species categories, all species and my species lists, are basically three different ways to get at your list of species that you could report. Going towards the bottom of the menu, uh, you can view your EdMaps login screen here. So if you wanted to just use the app and not even bother going to the EdMaps website, you can register for that EdMaps account directly here. If you already registered for the EdMaps account on the EdMaps website, you'll just log in with that account information on the app and that allows you to upload the reports later. I like to use this feature called My Species List, which basically lets me set a, a list of species that I commonly see and report. One of the really nice features of the app uh, is that it has a built-in field guide. And so if you see this information icon next to each species name, maybe we'll select Autumn Olive, uh, the app will show you pictures of that species and then on the bottom center part of that screen, you can click on the info tab and you'll see the written description of the plant. And then the bottom right is the map and this will load the map of all of the reports in the database of this species. So autumn olive is a really widely reported um, species and you'll see that it's predominantly in the Eastern half of the United States. We're gonna back out of that because it's gonna take a long time to load, but that's a nice option so you can see where it's been reported. And the pictures are great because it can help you double check uh, if you're not quite sure on the identification, you can see if you're close or if something seems way off based on comparing the pictures and the description. That's one reason why we really like the app. To actually report a species, you just click on the species name. And I want to use honeysuckle as an example, and I'm going to scroll way, way, way down on my list. When Matt talked about identifying honeysuckles, he mentioned that we have several species in Wisconsin of the non-native honeysuckles. And so there's actually four of them that are regulated. So if you want to really dig into plant identification and figure out exactly what species you have, that's great. But if you just want to say, hey, there's a non-native honeysuckle here because all of them get managed the same way, then this option towards the bottom of our list here called non-native bush honeysuckles is a great way to map that without needing to worry about the specific species that you have. So I've clicked on non-native bush honeysuckles and now I see the reporting form from the app. So the top will show the species with the common name and the scientific name. It shows me again the date and time that I opened the reporting form and then I can take a picture. And so it's really nice with the app, you can just take a picture right within the app. It doesn't save the pictures to your device, like in your photo library. So if you're one of those people that's always running out of storage because you have like too many cute pictures of your dog, you don't need to worry. The plant pictures won't compete with your cute dog pictures. Um, but basically to take a picture, you just open the camera, take a picture and we can take a nice picture of this spider plant because I'm stuck inside right now. The lower right hand of the screen will allow you to either use the photo or on the left hand, you can retake the photo. I like to point this out because if you're taking pictures of things outside, it might be windy or you might be trying to take a picture of something in moving water. And if the picture is really blurry, then the verifier is not gonna be able to do much with it. So do try to take clear pictures and you can just retake it if, if the wind happened to pick up and blow your plant around. Otherwise you can use that picture. We like to encourage people to take multiple pictures of what they're looking at. So you can take a picture of the whole plant or animal. And then if there's any close up features, it's great to get pictures of those too. So like Matt mentioned with the New Zealand mud snails, if you can put something for scale in the picture that can really help or show that it has that right-handed opening on it, that's super helpful for verifying reports. For plants, if you can get pictures of the whole plant and then show us 
close-ups of the leaves or any flowers or fruits, that really helps us verify the reports. Moving on down the reporting screen, the app will automatically show your latitude and longitude and it gives you an accuracy estimate. So 65 meters is not good. <laughs> it's better if you can get it to like 10 or 5 meters. But the good news is you can actually open the map by tapping on that map icon and you can see where the app thinks you are and you can scroll and change to show where you're actually reporting. So let's say I saw some honeysuckle and it was actually next to this parking lot. I can just tap on the screen and now that blue dot shows up where I've manually placed the point. So that's really helpful. This is also great for those of you that spend a lot of time along rivers. So maybe you see knotweed and it's across the river, but you don't have a way to get right next to that knotweed to mark where it is. This will allow you to just manually place that point across the river from where you are. If you look at the bottom of the screen, the app also has the option to map a polygon. Similar as, as the online reporting form we saw on the EdMaps website, you just tap where you want the edges of that polygon to go. So we'll just pretend that that whole area is covered in honeysuckle. And you'll see that just like the EdMaps website at the top of our screen here, it estimates the area. So we say we're done. The rest of the form you don't really have to do anything with, but you're welcome to. So if you spent a really long time hunting down some golden creeper maybe, because it's a, a rare plant in Wisconsin so far, but it took you an hour to find some, go ahead and change that time spent in minutes. The status default is positive, and that just means that you have found that species and it exists. You could mark it treated if you were mapping and managing an infestation at the same time. Or going back to that golden creeper example, if you were looking in a specific area for an early detection species like golden creeper, and did not find it, you could mark that as a negative. And so that will show up on the map to let other people know that you have checked in that area and haven't found it. So if you're working with a group of volunteers, that's a really handy way to kind of communicate with each other so you don't send a bunch of people to the same place multiple times and, and nobody finds anything. So once you've added in any extra information on the lower right hand corner of the screen, you can hit save. It tells you that your report has saved. If you didn't take a picture, it will remind you to take a picture. Then you can hit OK once that's all good. When you back out to the main menu then, your upload queue, which is about halfway down the menu, will have a red box with a number in it. And that will just show you how many reports that you've made that are still in your app. And so maybe you spent all day and you mapped 50 different infestations and you pat yourself on the back for a job well done and then you go home and you say great I mapped a bunch of stuff today. Well if you don't go into your upload queue and actually upload the reports nobody's ever going to know anything about that work that you did. So this is the important kind of last step of, of using the app to make sure that your reports get to us. Now I have a funny quirk on my <laughs> device right now, uh, where if I try to go into the My Upload queue on Gledon, the app shuts down. And so I'm working with the folks at EdMaps to get that fixed. And it seems to be just an individual problem right now. So I wouldn't worry for those of you that haven't used Gledon yet. Nobody else I know has this problem. But I am going to back out to the Mid-Atlantic app, which is set up exactly the same as Gledon, so you can see what the upload queue looks like. And so now I've opened the upload queue on the new app. This, by the way, is the iOS or Apple version of the app. The Android version looks a little bit different, but it's generally the same. So to upload these reports that I have, the, the Japanese barberry and garlic mustard reports that I made in this app, I have to select actions and then I can individually select the reports or if I had a bunch of them I could use the option at the bottom of the screen that says select all uh, and then once I've selected the reports I want to upload I hit upload and then oh I didn't log in yet oops <laughs> problem with using too many apps at once so it reminds you to log in if you haven't once you log in you can upload the reports and it'll give you a message when your reports are uploaded and that's when the verifiers on the other end get that email that say that there are reports to review. Now these are fake reports that I made, so I'm actually just going to go ahead and use the option at the bottom to delete these reports. But that is the upload queue, that is the last step you need to use to upload reports on the app. 
So that is the Gladden app in a nutshell. Pretty easy to use once you've got it on your device. You can use it on either Android or Apple tablets or smartphones. And if you're interested in using the app and, and you have some technical difficulties, I do encourage you to get in touch with me. I'm happy to help you get rolling with it. To add a species that could be asking like, how do you populate your my species list, which is like your custom species list. So mine is pretty full because I travel all over the state in a typical year. But if I wanted to adjust that on the upper above the menu, there's this edit button and that lists all of the possible species I could add in the app. And I just, if I wanted to add, for instance, Amur silvergrass, I select that and a blue check mark shows up. So that means that it's added to my list. So I can hit done, um, or maybe another way to add it uh, is if you go to access the species list in another way, maybe we're looking at our aquatics and I wanted to um, look at Eurasian water milfoil because we just learned about that from Matt today. So I'm in the field guide portion of that again by clicking on the, the information icon. But you'll see in that field guide portion on the upper right side above the picture, there's that option to add to my list. And so when I select that, that, uh, that means that the Eurasian water milfoil is now on my list. Another way that Bill might be asking this question is there are species that are not included in the app that you might be interested in mapping or monitoring. And part of that is because of that built-in field guide component. They didn't include every possible invasive species because the storage space it would take up to include like the pictures and information for all of those. So another way you can report those species is this option called unlisted plant. And so that brings you to that same reporting form that we saw before, but you'll see that the species name just says unlisted. And the way that we typically deal with this is if you know it's a species or you think you know what the species is, just add that information in this note section at the bottom of the reporting form. And then you can go to the EdMaps website later to edit your report and update that species name or your verifier might see your notes and, and verify the identification based on your pictures and change the species name for you. All right, any other questions at this point, Matt? Her question is, how long does it take for a report to be verified and posted to the actual map? How long do the negative reports remain on the map? Thanks. So the, the verification depends on us humans who are on the other side. So it depends on you know, how busy we are. In a typical field season, when we're also out in the field, it might take a few days. Um, but usually, we're able to verify reports within a day of you submitting them, or we'll contact you if we need further information about those reports. How long do negative reports remain on the map? Meaning, if you have a false, because you, you, there is an option to report you didn't see anything? How long would that be up there? We don't actually see a lot of negative reports come in, so I, I can't say that I'm 100% certain on this answer, but typically a negative report will stay there unless the same reporter comes and updates that report with a revisit. So that's an option you can use uh, through that My EdMaps portal, so, or if that reporter deletes that negative report out of their list of reports, then that would be off of the, the database. Getting into kind of revisits and how you update records, there is a newer app from EdMaps called EdMaps Pro, which is just launching. And that's kind of more of the professional level app that is better set up for those types of revisits where you can change the status of an infestation. So maybe it's grown or maybe it's responding to management and the infestation size is shrinking. EdMaps Pro will kind of let you officially revisit that same record, whether you were the initial reporter or not. But that's a whole separate training. But if you are interested in EdMaps Pro, feel free to shoot me an email and I'll, I'll have my contact information at the end and I can point you to some resources to use that app if that kind of revisit component is important to your work. If reporting online or using the apps doesn't sound all that appealing to you, but you still wanna help out and let us know when you find something, you can definitely also email reports to either me or Matt or both of us. Um, and basically we're requiring the same information that we would if you reported on the app. So that would be the date that you saw the species, what species you think it is, the location, and we really want you to be specific with that. So GPS coordinates are ideal, but if not, you can give us like an intersection and directions from the intersection or something of that nature. And then the fourth piece of information is to send the photographs along with that. 
So email reporting is also an option. Moving on from reporting, on our First Detector Network website under this tools tab, we have a couple tools that we've recently developed. One is the WISTIP viewer. Basically, this is just an interactive map that shows all of the records that we've received and we've gotten help from DNR as well. They've shared a bunch of their records with us. So I'm gonna switch over to the viewer itself. It is the terrestrial invasive plant presence viewer, so you won't be seeing things like the curly leaf pondweed or the Eurasian, Eurasian water milfoil for that, but there are other tools that Matt might touch on that you can use to view where those have been reported. This does include some of those wetland species though, like the loose strife, the knotweeds, Japanese hops, things like that. So you can play around with this map, zoom in to see what other people have reported in your area on the right side of the map, it's just the legend showing you all of the species. And then the graph shows you the cumulative number of reports. Below the legend, there are uh, menus that you can use to filter. So if you wanna see where prohibited or those split listed species have been reported, you could update the map with that. So this is just a fun tool to kind of play around with if you wanna see what other folks have been reporting. Our other tool that I wanted to touch on briefly is our invasive species calendar. And this tool is more designed to help you figure out what to look for. So Matt talked about prohibited and restricted species at the beginning of his identification section. And if you didn't know, there are over 140 invasive plants alone on our state regulated species list. And there are additional animals and insects and plant diseases. So lots and lots of invasive species to potentially monitor for. So it's really difficult to figure out like in that huge list of species what you might be looking for or what you should look for at a particular time of year. And so this calendar includes most of the, the common invasive species and some of our early detection species as well. And just like the map, you can use these drop down menus that are above the calendar to filter for species or areas that you're interested in. So if you wanted to only look at our aquatic habitats, maybe we'll throw wetland in there as well, we can apply that. The calendar updates with species that are found in those habitats, so you've already narrowed down that list of species. The colors of the circles, as you can see on the right side of the screen, show the dominant life stage of that plant or animal, uh, and then the how filled in the circle is, it denotes the detectability. So if something is totally filled in, that means that that's gonna be the best time to look for that species. If it's totally empty, it's probably not worth your effort to look for that species in that month. And so if we look at yellow iris, which is about halfway down this list, you'll see it's really good to start looking for that in May and June, that's when it's flowering but it's trickier to identify before that or after that when it's not flowering because it can look very similar to other uh, native iris species versus some of our other plants, you're not gonna really see them or be able to identify them very easily until later in the summer. So those were just a couple of resources that we encourage you to check out on the First Detector Network website. For now, I'd like to throw it back to Matt. Now that you've learned how to identify some of the plants and how to report them, he's gonna talk about some of the priority locations for reporting these species uh, based on some of the work that the Upper Sugar River Watershed Association is doing right now. Yeah, Anne had asked us as part of this series to find our own local priorities. And these are gonna be based upon what some management plans have talked about in the region as well as some cool tools for you trout fishermen out there, because we also have found that a lot of these move along recreational pathways. So people using our great water resources can be a way that stuff spreads. So a couple tips about where we're doing prioritization of getting these records, and then also the trout maps. So to start, we're gonna talk about the West Branch of the Pecatonica watershed. So these are coming from management plans that were created in the region. And these were the regions that were highlighted as the most valuable as far as they had some invasives, but they were still reasonably pristine. And we also thought they had the highest risk of new infestation because of recreational activities and population size and all that kind of stuff. 
And the regions in particular that we're talking about are these reaches. And they're, um, so way you can help us is we are identifying and surveying what's called reach one to reach nine. And each of these has a corresponding section from the headwaters to a, to a certain bridge uh, or road or whatever it is. So this whole region, um, by getting us reports in this particular area, you're gonna help move forward some management plan stuff that's happening and that we wanna prioritize. And so a map of that, what does that look like? Here's uh, the West Branch, so starting up at Cobb, and you can kind of see where each of those are. So we'd ask, you know, people kind of hit up one and, and, uh, and then move down from there if possible. And we're looking at uh, one through nine, so this is one through six. And then here is two through nine. So that region of the world would be great to get some extra eyes on as we're making plans for doing control and inventory stuff. Second area is the West Fork of the Kickapoo River watershed. This is again another prioritized area from regional managers and has a very similar system. So there's nine different reaches with the same prioritization reach one to reach nine. That's what we're looking at. And here are the maps in particular of the those reaches. So starting all the way at the top and working our way down from nine all the way to reach one. And we'd ask that you start at reach one and kind of, you know, go from there. So that's where, that's where I'm looking and that's where I can use help at the moment. And finally, our trout streams. Uh, so here's a cool tool, Trout Regulation and Opportunity User Tool. Of course, it, the acronym also spells trout. And you can launch this app. And when you do, it will pop up this great map. And so these, uh, these are the trout streams with green, yellow, and red, kind of based upon how, if they're class one, class two, class three, and that's basically for how sustainable they are for long-term fisheries and how, they, how they're treated. Any of these trout streams, if you're out there doing this work in the region, uh, we'd love to have extra eyes on the ground. Again, because recreational boaters and fishermen tend to be a way to move the stuff around, there's a higher risk of that. Stuff that might have been transported there, and uh, you're gonna, and hey, maybe it's a great excuse to go do some trout fishing. One of the things that we like to know is we're looking for new detections in particular, and a way that you can see if the DNR already formally knows about that. Ed maps and the tools that Ann mentioned earlier are a great way, but there's also a nice interactive map here, which is the surface water data viewer. And so here's a, you click on that launch button here. And then once you pull up that on the top tab, you go to additional resources and then click on the lakes and AAS viewer. And that will pop up a view of the current situation. And I'll actually just do a quick, I have that pulled up right now. I'll do a quick demo of what that looks like. This is kind of neat. So we're in here and you can kind of zoom around and see different layers. I click on this Lake and AIS viewer there. So here it's pulling up our map. Here's all of our different things on the side. Um, I'm gonna pop up an invasive wetland plants and look at Japanese knotweed. Click on that one. And then based upon our scale, that's gonna pop up stuff. So the other spot that you always wanna check for invasives is downstream of where we know there are invasives. So that's always a great spot to look for. So. You know, if you see one on the map, you can make sure it's there and maybe see if it's spreading and report from there. If you have any questions, here's, here's my email, matt at uppersugar.org. You can also feel free to leave a message. So okay. yeah, I just wanna give a huge thanks to Matt for giving us the local perspective of some of the species we're concerned about, particularly around our waterways. As you've probably gathered, whether you're looking for terrestrial or aquatic invasive species, they're all impacting our watersheds and our ecosystems um, in lots of different ways. And so if you live near those kind of priority areas that Matt and the Upper Sugar River Watershed Association are working on, on the Pecatonica or the Kickapoo, it would be super awesome if you could spend some time scouting out invasive species in those areas because they can use that information immediately. If you're not in those areas or not maybe able to like hop in your boat and paddle down a river, I'll say from the First Detector Network's perspective, because we operate statewide and we work with a lot of different 
land managers and uh, invasive species groups in the state, we're happy to get reports of anything from anywhere. And so we hope that whichever option you're able to help out with, we hope that you'll get outside because uh, that's one of the best things we can all do right now is get outside and then keep your eyes open for some of those invasive species. Be in touch with us to email us reports or questions or if you need help with the app, then definitely get in touch with me. I'm happy to get you started on that. So we wanna thank everybody for joining us today. And I just wanna go ahead and just echo Anne's thanks and say that we appreciate the partnership that we can have between UW Extension and Wisconsin First Detector Network. It's been a great resource for us to share with our members. Uh, we also do always prioritize invasive species monitoring in the Upper Sugar River watershed as you might imagine. So that's also on my list. Please be in touch. We look forward to seeing some of these reports come rolling in and we hope that you are all staying safe and healthy.